God's first creative act is scattered across the pages of the Bible. You can pull together enough information to answer rudimentary questions, but that is where it stops. The Bible was not written to satisfy man's endless curiosity. It gives basic information on some events, but when it comes to further details, the pages fall silent. And that is precisely the case with the subject of spirit beings. Now, the Bible calls spirits by many different names, some singular, some plural. We often call them angels. But the Bible uses many terms to define them. Cherubim, seraphim, archangels, angels, morning star, the list goes on. Collectively, they are referred to as multitudes, hosts, or stars. Now, if you see the term stars or hosts used, the context will reveal whether it's the stars in the night sky or angels. Now, they may all have personal names, but only a few of them are mentioned, such as Gabriel and Michael. As with God, spirits are invisible, having no bodies of flesh and blood like you and me. Even though you can't see them, they may be everywhere. The Bible indicates that there are thousands upon thousands of angels. The idiom used to number just those surrounding God's throne communicates an unfathomable sum. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne. The angelic beings were created to serve God and to do His pleasure. They are called ministering spirits. Praise the Lord, you His angels, you mighty ones who do His bidding, who obey His word. Praise the Lord, all His heavenly hosts, you His servants who do His will. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve? The word angel is derived from the Greek term meaning messenger or servant. Because God created them, they belonged to Him and were to do whatsoever God asked them to do. Now, the concept of the Creator also being the owner has lost its strength in our industrialized money-driven economy. But I remember walking through a tribal village in Papua New Guinea and every item I asked about, whose paddle is this, whose canoe is that, all elicited a response that designated an owner. And uh, upon inquiring how they knew who the owner was, they looked at me somewhat, you know, they just could hardly believe that I'd be asking that. The owner was the one who made it. That was obvious. The creator-owner connection was very, very strong. When I questioned them if it would be all right for me to break a paddle, they were just as emphatic that that would not be wise, unless I wanted to have trouble with the creator-owner. Taking it a step further, I asked them, I said, would it be acceptable for the owner to break it? Well, they kind of gave a tribal version of a shrug and a nod, and they said, well, it's okay for the owner to break it. He made it. God created the angels, and so it was not out of place for them to be considered His possessions. And since they belonged to Him, they were to do His bidding as His servants, as His messengers. Now, remember, that's what the word angel means. Now, this was not some sort of ancient form of servitude. There are no parallels here to forced bondage. The angels could have had no better creator-owner. To carry out His directives, God created the angels with great intellect and power. Some of these angelic beings had more capability than others. The angels were created perfect, without any evil, but they weren't robots. They had their own will, which gave them the ability to choose. Now, angels share some similarities with man, though man is not nearly as powerful or intelligent. The Bible says that God made man a little lower than the angels. Though similar, angels are distinct from man. They never die. They neither marry nor reproduce. Though normally unseen on certain assignments, they make themselves visible. When they talk to man, the language they use is understandable to the hearer. The most powerful, the most intelligent, the most beautiful spirit ever created was a cherub. His name is translated as Lucifer, which means shining one or morning star. O Lucifer, son of the morning. 
Lucifer was referred to as an anointed cherub. Now, the meaning of the word anointed has its origins in the ancient rite of pouring oil on someone or something to set it apart to God for a special task. And this act was considered sacred. It was not to be taken lightly. The Bible says of Lucifer, You are anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You are on the holy mount of God. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. It seems that Lucifer's job kept him in the presence of God at all times. Perhaps he somehow represented the rest of the angels and led them in their worship and praise of their creator owner. We'll learn more about this anointed cherub later. The word worship comes from the old English word meaning to declare a person's worth. The Bible says that all the angels worshiped God. You give life to everything and the multitudes of heaven worship you. This is only fitting since God is the sovereign king and as such rightly deserves to have his worth declared. By way of contrast, if I'm boasting about a friend's deeds, someone else can call it into question whether my friend deserves such praise as I'm giving. But the Bible says God is worthy of all praise. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. God's creative act had begun. Now, as all the angelic host watched and rejoiced, God embarked upon his next great work of art. His canvas, the universe. His subject, the whole earth. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars, spirit beings, sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. <laughs> 